Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Charlotte Stebbing Mills, and today I'm joined by Gemma McFall, who is a highly decorated ICF coach and the only SERPA trained chronic pain practitioner in the Middle East and also a Gallup Strengths team facilitator. Welcome to the show, Gemma. Thank you. That was a good introduction. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. Um, I, I love geeking out on this topic. So <laughs> I, I'm <laughs> happy to have you here because this is the second time I'm interviewing you. The first time was for our Stress Relief in Your Pocket podcast, where we was diving into overcoming chronic pain. And today I really, really want to focus on with you chronic pain at work specifically, because it's such an important area that I think gets overlooked. And I'm sure we're going to tap into that in today's chat. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my favorite time. <laughs> I have chronic pain at work. <laughs> so I'm happy, happy to go there. All right, all right, cool. So let's let's kick off then. Cause I've heard you say, and, and obviously I've I've seen this in some research that comes up as well, is that back pain is one of the top causes of absenteeism, perhaps even the top one. So tell us a bit more about that. Give us some context. Yeah, I mean, it's true, but back pain is the number one cause of um, absenteeism. And uh, and it, we think, you know, when, when we've got back pain, we've, we've got to go down the medical route of, I go see a doctor, the doctor gives me medication. If that doesn't work, we try physio, and after physio, that doesn't work, then we see specialists, maybe a chiropractor, an osteopath. And then from there, if that doesn't work, surgery. And, um, I know in this week specifically, you can escalate from, I have a little twinge in my back to, I need surgery within the space of like a month or two, yeah. if not less. It's quite scary. Some of the stories that I've heard here. So, um, and it's not just here, it's yeah. getting, it's getting, uh, you know, more and more widespread and um, the number of chronic back pain, back pain cases is just getting higher and higher each year yeah it's not getting better uh, but the human body has not got more fragile over the years has it so exactly interesting exactly if anything with the resources we have available we could be the most robust we've ever been so it's really interesting to see the numbers are saying the complete opposite so tell us a bit more about the impact of kind of chronic pain and the the work situation, because a lot of workplaces, they some of them, I believe, have chronic pain on the radar, which is why we see things like, um, you know, ergonomic setups, awareness pieces, education pieces in there. Uh, but typically, and, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but typically we see that it's almost left to health insurance and then that's that's kind of it. That's where the conversation stops. So tell us your take. This is what you do. Yeah, totally. I mean, I share my own story. I when I moved to Dubai in 2010, I think it was originally we came here. I had a back so minor, like just a twinge in my back. And my boss was great. Um, she gave me time off work to pop down the road for physio sessions. She would ask me how I'm doing. She would check if I had enough cushions behind my back, you know, this type of thing. Yeah. Um, but there's very little an employer can do other than um, keep checking you're all right, get you the right chair, get you the right desk and all of this. But maybe later we'll come on to why I don't think the chairs and desks is the answer. Um, but yeah, it's it's very much like you, you take, especially here because it's insurance based, you go with your little plastic card. For 10 years, I used this little plastic insurance card to get as much medication as I want, physio, osteopath, and I was on a waiting list for surgery. I didn't spend a single penny on any of that. So for me, as a, you know, as an employee, that was great, but I also was in HR, so I could see the premiums going up a year on the medical insurance. So it is, it is interesting. And I'm just to link back to what you said at the beginning about absenteeism. Back pain is not just about absenteeism, it's present, presenteeism, you know, I, I spent hours sitting in my office chair, half available for people, because my brain constantly was thinking about the pain, I was comfortable, I'd sit in meetings, like kind of on an angle, I'd have to stand up, I'd have to walk when the pain was that bad. So it's not just about missing work it's about being at work and being at work if that makes sense yeah and it can be like a really vicious cycle as well right the presenteeism creates the absenteeism and you know like you said if you're perhaps focusing on the things that maybe are not as effective that cycle is only going to continue to become more frequent and eventually you won't even be able to be present 
physically, but also that mentally, emotionally, productively, creatively is showing up full of vitality. And really that's what employers want, right? <laughs> totally, totally. And, and I think about the knock-on effect it has on the people working for a leader that's yep. got back pain. Yep. Um, or the other interesting angle here is, you know, maybe as a leader, you can hold it together at work and you're wonderful, amazing, yep. super high achiever leader. You get home in the evening and you just are in pieces on the sofa because your back hurts so much or other physical symptoms, not just back pain. Yep. And then your family gets the worst of you. Yep. So and then yeah. that's then that's in a very slippery slope, isn't it? Because then you start to see the knock on effect it has and then on all areas of life. And it's it's something that can't it can't be ignored. And the thing with chronic pain that I've noticed is it's almost like put on the back burner. It's just this thing that I live with is part of who I am. I have this. And they like people own it. And I've been there. My partner has also experienced a lot of um, chronic pain, back pain specifically to the point of getting blurry vision and um, like just not being able to function properly. So like I've got that firsthand experience of it, but there was still always this element of, oh, it will go away or I'll try this thing. I'll try that thing. There was it, there wasn't really too many solutions until I started to unpack what chronic pain actually is and what it represents so for our listeners tell us the difference between like normal pain chronic pain and you know the type of work that you do because you definitely have a different approach to the physio sessions the you know pills and everything else uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting what you're saying about just becomes part of your life. Um, this is hedonic adaptation. It's you get used to having a bit of back pain. So you maybe stop running. And then now you don't run, you're no longer a runner. And that becomes normal that you just don't run. And then a bit later, now the pain is worse. Oh, now I stop cycling as well. Oh, now I can't bend down to the bottom cupboard. But because of this head uh, thing, we just keep adapting and that becomes our normal. And then I hear people say things like, oh, it's just because I'm old. Like old does not equal pain yeah. at all. Like this is like such a wrong, um, wrong belief. So um what was your question again? <laughs> Wait, my question is around like sharing with our listeners the differences between normal pain and oh. chronic pain. Yes. So uh, acute pain is yeah. when you have an injury and it hurts because it's an injury, let's say. Yeah. Maybe you uh, fell over and twisted your ankle. This yeah. is acute pain. Given the right uh, rest period and maybe you need physio on it possibly or medication possibly, it should fix itself within the space of whatever is the recommended guidelines, but yep. three months maximum, right? Yep. Um, if your body is susceptible to healing itself, it should, it should just um, heal. I don't work with acute pain. This is where the medical industry is amazing. Um, you can you have an accident you go to the hospital they can help you this is this is what they are absolutely best at but when it comes to chronic pain chronic pain is where you've had symptoms for more than let's say three months yep. and it doesn't have to be continuously for three months but you've had it on off for three months or more yep. um, and it's not going away so it could still be that say ankle thing we just talked about but it becomes chronic at the point of kind of three months. Yeah. Um, and that's where I specialize. And going back to your question about what do I do that's different to the medical industry? Well, by the point of chronic pain, if we're still going to a doctor, they're just going to keep on fixing the symptoms. So it hurts. Oh, well, okay, let's mask that pain by giving you some more medication. Or let's keep manipulating the ankle or the knee or the back or whatever until, until we can... Um, heal it whereas what i know about pain given you know latest science and, and research on this is that chronic pain is is oftentimes almost always created by the brain because it's become a learned pathway mm -hmm. so the easiest way to explain this yep. is we learn to ride a bike you never forget you can never, ever forget how to learn to ride a bike. You you just get on it and you can do it. And that's because the neural pathway is established in your brain. Yep. Pain is the same. So you have an, uh, a pain signal that says, oh, when I bend down like this, I'm going to get pain. Yep. The more times you feel that pain, the stronger the neural pathway gets and the worse the pain gets. And yep. that's why chronic pain escalates over many years, getting worse and worse and worse. So the way I work with people, it's not about the body. It's not about what you see on an MRI scan. We can talk about MRI scans later, but it's about 
Why is your brain misfiring signal into your body causing pain yep. when the actual incident has long gone and passed? Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah, definitely. In a nutshell. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. And I think it's so interesting. So when we go back into the context of workplaces, we are seeing workplaces and the environment almost like accommodating to give the pain space to be there rather than actually resolving it. And that's where I'd, I'd love for you to share a little bit more deeply is like what it is you really then do as part of your practice. Yeah. Well, in corporate environments, um, I go in and do workshops on what we call neuroplastic pain. And it's a very simple workshop, but it's mind blowing for people. They sit there and they, they're they sitting there, they come to the workshop because they've either got anxiety or pain. I kind of cover a topic in one. And we talk about, um, you know, the human body was designed billions of years ago to, um, to go into the, the state of fight flight if we're going to be attacked by a tiger in the jungle. You know, that's why we have this uh, nervous system. But in the modern day now, there is no tiger that's going to come and bite us. In fact, I live here in Dubai and it's one of the safest places ever. So there is no physical threat anymore. But the threats are emotional threats like mortgage payments, rent to cover. Will I get fired or not? Um, does my boss like me or not? Um, these are the emotional threats. And the brain can't tell the difference between physical and emotional threats. It's the same area of the brain where pain is activated that kind of comes on, gives the pain. So in these workshops, I kind of, I teach it on a very, very basic scientific level but then i also take the participants through exercises so they can experience what it feels like to go into their body um, and i can guide them through exercises so that they can see how their physical symptoms can move around it, it's it's fascinating i had i had a guy the last one it was really funny he came at, at the end of the the exercise he opened his eyes and he went oh my goodness, when you started talking, I had neck pain. And then the neck pain completely vanished. And then it came back. And then it went again. And he yeah. went, I've been seeing a physio for 18 months about my neck. And I was like, can you now see that the pain is being created by the signals in your brain, not yet? Yeah. You know, so it, it is so amazing. interesting, right? There, there's got to be like a few like dots that have to connect for people to get that and, and to feel an experience here. But what I can really hear what what you're saying is like it's connecting people back to themselves and connecting them and having that awareness to what's actually going on and it's interesting because I mentioned my partner earlier and I mean I mean it's like probably a decade almost of chronic pain and for him it was very much a case of just becoming aware of what was going on inside because like his go-to um, emotion was like anger and get the job done that was it like that was kind of like the the headspace he was in because of the pressures that I know you talk about in terms of like responsibilities and you know certain pressure from above certain pressure in life you know it's all going to add up and I think the minute we get out of our head and back into our body we almost take for want of a better term take back a bit of control over what we're experiencing as much as we can't control what we're experiencing we can influence it through our awareness is that right yeah 100 percent um but what I do want to add on to this is, you know, like if someone's listening and they're always woo woo, like yeah. I am so not woo woo. <laughs> I, I am science. And I think a large part of the, the workshops, it's education about why did your nervous system go on high alert in the first place? Why, why does your body feel unsafe? And there's two key areas. One is personality types so I literally go through do you have these personality types if you do and it could be your own personality that's creating that that stress yep. and also past events and so I teach people that something that happened to you when you were maybe eight years old could be the reason that you have anxiety or stress today yep. and why I teach them like you know why that is and you can literally see the penny dropping as I'm giving examples. People are like, you're reading my mind. How did you know? Like, how did you know that happened to me? I'm like, well, I just know these instant, like boarding schools are a good example. There's a very d direct correlation between people that were in boarding school or in the military or that uh, lost a parent when they were younger, lived with an alcoholic. Yep. These type of things put a child into fight or flight and that child gets used to that feeling and they grow up to be an adult that's still in that same feeling. It's just, I love it. 
it, it is and it's, it's so connected we had um charlie spurway on talking about relationships at work and we were speaking about attachment theory and then we obviously learned that when we're young and that how that translates so anyone listening be worth listening to that as well because we talk about the specific attachment types and the effect of that on the nervous system um so what i want to cover with you is like where does the role that leadership plays in this because you mentioned personality types and past experiences and your actual day-to-day reality will have an influence as well so what where does the kind of leadership responsibility lie in supporting employees that might be experiencing and for sure experiencing obviously their own personalities and past experiences they might be bringing into the present day yeah so as a manager it is not your job to sit there and be a therapist for the employee absolutely not and also don't expect managers to understand the neuroscience of pain because it's taken me (laughs) years to 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 figure this all out but what I would say is, I'll give you a good example. I worked with um, a very senior leader who had back pain. He got rid of the back pain. And then when he then had staff members in his company with back pain, he would send them off to watch videos on YouTube on the subject. Now, there are so many that, that you could send people to watch. But what would be better to get someone like me to come in and teach all your staff the answer? You know, like this is the answer. So the knowledge is really important. So encouraging them to keep going to the doctor is not the answer. You need to go to the doctor to get life-threatening things ruled out. And if you've still pain after three months, the traditional medical system is not the right answer. So that's the first thing, the education. But the second thing, as a leader, what you can do to help somebody with back pain is to make sure they feel safe. The key thing is make that person feel safe. Do they know their job is safe? Do you check in with them as a human? Do you know what's going on for them at home? Mm -hmm. Um, Because people who don't feel safe, uh, their nervous system is very dysregulated and hence leads to back pain or other pains, like myalgia, long COVID. Yeah, Yeah. I I think... think yeah it definitely answers the question because it is really important and and like you said like that you know people that have been through it are always going to be the ones most excited to refer them onto a video or to somebody like yourself which is great i don't know that that we're talking about the majority yet when it comes to leaders particularly in this region as well and probably globally um but the interesting thing that you said there is i think we've got an opportunity to catch it we've got an opportunity to catch if somebody is experiencing chronic pain through conversation by actually understanding and treating them like a human being, but we've also got the opportunity to catch it literally in the data on the back end. Look at the insurance, like you said, look at the insurance premiums, look at how much, how many days off somebody is having to go to the doctor or how much time they're um, leaving work to go and address it. Because like from there, if again, like you said, if it's happening after like a three month period or you see a pattern over three months, you, they can then raise that and say, hey, I've noticed this pattern. Did you know this? Right. And that's where they can have some assets, perhaps like even from somebody like yourself there as part of their assets within the organization. So it's it's all and then that can easily come into like a health and safety piece as well. Uh, what Do you have a link to um, like health and safety with the work that you do? Um. I would say I'm the anti-ergonomics person. (laughs) Somebody asked me if I would do an ergonomics talk for them. And I was like, I can do you a talk on back pain and sitting at a desk, but it certainly wouldn't involve ergonomics because um, there is no correlation between resting posture and back pain. There is loads and loads of people who have terrible posture, yet they have no back pain. Um, so it doesn't mean that your back, a bad posture equals back pain. And actually the year that the ergonomics um, rules came out, where your position of your computer should be and how, you know, where your ankles and your knees, everything from that year, the number of incidents of RSI and wrists yeah. and back pain and everything has gone up and up and up and up. So that again, it's just proves doesn't it that there is no correlation that is very interesting i did i didn't know that Uh, that's really really interesting because again it's just another example of how we need to start thinking forward and start looking at alternative solutions because we see this in so many different areas of well-being is like the things that perhaps we thought used to work 
uh, either didn't or they've stopped working for whatever reason right not obviously with anonymous there's clearly no evidence of that whatsoever with the the way the stats are, are mounting up now so what is the go-to solution you've already mentioned a few things and i know you've kind of got your own process and i know you've got like different research and things like that that influence the, the way that you think and the way that you then service the corporates that you work with and the individuals tell us a little bit more about that so somebody's hearing you and they're like okay all right so that's not the way to do it what is the way to approach this so the 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 nuts and bolts of it is that we need to teach your brain how to feel safe so it doesn't keep firing signals of pain into your body and the way i do it i'll go through my four step method that i do with individuals and, and groups uh, because I definitely people can take away nuggets from that and do it themselves. So there's four P's. The first P is understanding neuroplastic pain and how and why we really have pain. And the only way you can really do that is to get away from the medical system completely, stop looking at MRI scans and, and just throw yourself into the research of it. Um, so that's the first thing. They can get information on that feeling being on my mailing list because I send I send stuff every week on the on the science behind pain so the number one thing is pain education the next thing is personality and understanding your certain personality type might be causing uh pain or anxiety um I use Gallup um as my main uh tool Gallup strength and this is something companies do already on a leadership level. I go in and do workshops on leadership using Gallup. They always put a spin on it. When you know who you are, you feel safer. There's less confrontation with other people. The team gels better. Like underneath all of that is psychological safety. Yep. So that's the second P, personality. The third P is past. I would encourage people to literally do a timeline from the day they were born until today what happened to them at what age? How many times did they move school? How many times did they move country? Did people pass away? Were they bullied? You know, um, did they go to boarding school? And so on and so on. And then look back at that little version of themselves and go, wow, gosh, there's a lot I went through. Yeah. You know, there's a lot I went through. There doesn't always need to be things in the past, honestly. Um, but for some people, the past is is a, a really interesting exercise. Just and just then the last thing is perhaps, just on that yeah. as well, I think it's just important to mention that it doesn't always have to be like extreme things that have happened in the past. Um, and sometimes it can be something that might, if you're comparing it to other scenarios, you might belittle it and not, not even put it on your list. But actually, if it was that meaningful and important to you and it's significant and you've remembered it, then it belongs on the list. Um, it's oh, really 100%. important. <laughs> the subconscious can be sneaky sometimes, right? <laughs> and sometimes we, we can almost like put ourselves at the bottom of a list and sometimes that doesn't help when you're digging into the root cause of an issue oh yeah I, I couldn't agree with you more that is so 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 true and most people when I start with them they say my childhood was a perfect they literally use the word either perfect or joyous or I'm so grateful and then we start digging in I mean I don't dig so deep like a therapist we're literally just skimming the surface to see what's there to start with and then they start saying things like, oh, yeah, like my my childhood was great because my dad never beat me up. He only beat my sisters up, you know, mm -hmm. or like, and I'm like, but you watched this happen. Oh, yeah. So I, I should be lucky, you mm -hmm. know, they compare themselves and they always um, sort of downplay. And I've had clients that have said, oh, yeah, my, my mother or father passed away when I was just, I don't know, whatever age, but it made me stronger. Yeah. You know, like there's always the but, yeah. um, and it's allowing yourself, right? Because there, there is that yeah. intention. It's also protection, but it's also sometimes a bit of a blanket that lays over something like chronic pain. Yeah. Isn't it? A hundred percent. Yeah. The 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 past is it, is interesting. It really doesn't need to be big things on that list. Is it, 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 what is traumatic to a five year old? You know, it's not looking back on it now that I'm older. Oh, that wasn't a small thing. It's what happened. What? How do you feel when you were that age? Nice. Um. So that's the first piece, and then just quickly, the last P is um practical day to day things that you can do either at work or at home to um literally calm the brain down so if I think about when I was working in HR yeah. 
it was hospitality industry. So it was incredibly long hours and I was managing a big team. The way that my day looked, I went in early to get work done before the rest of the team came in. So that was my first problem. Yep. (laughs) And then... And then for the rest of the day, it was either one of my team in asking me a question or me going to the other senior leaders to to discuss with them or meetings, or I was doing a termination or I was doing interviews. And then I would quickly have lunch. But again, I would sit with um, staff members. So I'm again, talking about work-related things, straight back to my desk. And then often I would work longer hours just to get something done while the office was quiet after everybody had left. Um, And so... At no point during those hours did I even take two seconds to go, oh, you know, there's not one single second. And now with mobile phones, you know, people even go to the toilet with their mobile phone. And even while they're in the toilet, they're checking messages and responding. And there's zero time. You're at work and you're literally in fight or flight for the entire day. And then it depends on what you're going home to at at home. But let's say you've got a two-year-old and a five-year-old running around at home. The minute you walk in the door, it could be a battleground, fighting and arguing and crying and the bedtime routine and blah, blah, blah. And then you do the whole thing again the next day. Yeah. And it's it's so interesting you say that, right? Because we're just on all of the time now nervous system is on all of the time now we can be on we can be present we can be engaged with life but our nervous system doesn't have to be in that freak out mode right in that fight or flight or the opposite right in an incomplete withdrawal um and you know to carry on with your example there the reality is that we're seeing as well when we do wellness assessments with organizations is most of the time people are selecting the um the answer in some of our assessments to say that they are uh, falling asleep with screens, right? That that's the go-to thing, either whether that's um, because they're continuing work or whether that's because they're just on their screens entertaining themselves. Like it doesn't really matter. We're still applying more and more stress from the blue light that's coming in through whatever you're actually engaging with is creating more stimulation. So the, the nervous system has to at some point almost like unplug a little bit and come back. So that being said, what are some of your like, practical day-to-day things then that somebody can do and I think you hinted at a really good one when you went ah, and you took really? a breath yeah <laughs> you took a breath you come out of the air which is I mean, do you know though just before we addressed it I have to say when I had back pain I did not consider I was stressed and if I listened to a podcast like this I would be thinking to myself very confidently no this does not apply to me because I never miss a deadline I'm not stressed. I literally did not feel stressed. And I was a super mom, super HR director. So it was like excelling in every area of life and we're fitting the gym in, you know? And I convinced myself that I was amazing. The only downside was the back pain. Yeah. But what I now know is it is easier to feel physical pain than emotional pain. Yep. That's a key thing. And so I was feeling physical pain. The other key thing is because I grew up, already with um like a nervous system that was nervous is probably a good way of saying it my nervous system was always on to me being in this state high alert is normal I had never ever experienced what it feels like to feel calm so I thought I was calm and then I would look at other people and I'd like oh look they're calm I'm also calm because I can't see inside their body I don't know what their calm feels like And so I prided myself on the adrenaline and how fast and how much I could get done. So I think the first thing is acknowledging if you want to get rid of the back pain, you sort of need to go, okay, fine. Even though I don't feel stressed, I'm going to try some of these techniques. (laughs) And and also on that as well, it's very, very common to see that in high performers, right? It's very common to see that in senior leadership as well. Um, It's... It's like, imagine a like a fish being in water, like it doesn't really know it's in water, right? It's that feeling, right? And I think we need to establish what does it look like? And there will be signals. And I think the body is the best place to look for those signals because the body will always be trying to reveal something to you. And if it's not the physical body, it will be probably mental symptoms or emotional outbursts and things like that that come up from time to time. But be- because it's finished and gone, we forget about it. So I think like listening to those cues is absolutely necessary. I'm so glad that you mentioned that, Gemma. 
I would love to share with you what my signals were, which I didn't know at the time. It's only looking back on it. One of the things I did all the time, if something went wrong, like somebody didn't submit a report or uh, I don't know, whatever. I get an email from someone that didn't say what I wanted to. I would literally sit there and go, oh, okay. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, like I'm so annoyed. Yeah. It's like that person is so stupid. Now I need to do this, you know, like very, um, it's really hard to describe, but it was like this internal feeling of like uh, disappointment, anger, frustration. And that was one of my big ones. Another one was um, with the kids um, because my kids were pretty little at the point when I was at my worst and I would get really snappy with them. I wouldn't shout. I would never shout. I would just kind of go into this like almost like I was snappy on the inside, but the outside was smiling. (laughs) It's really hard to describe. And I think anybody that's listening that's got kids will know what I mean, like the littlest trigger would yep. be like the TV is too loud. I'd be like, turn the TV down, you know, like everything was. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the little signals are key. Yeah, and it's so interesting because there's so many different signals that I think people need to tune into their own to see what they are. Like, I think what you've just shared there, like that almost resentment that comes through when something doesn't go your way, particularly when there's other people involved as well, is like very commonly um, ignored as well. That is even an emotion or a state, which I find quite interesting because it's one of the most common ones that people carry right? They carry resentment into the next meeting at work or they carry that resentment into the next um, performance review and then get even more resentment if they don't end up getting a pay rise or promotion or whatever, right? And it just builds and builds and builds. And that's when it can start to manifest, right? And obviously we're, we're focusing on chronic pain today. So Anybody experiencing the chronic pain, chances are there's something going on that's uh, yeah. just signaling you to say, let's pay attention and perhaps try some of these exercises you're going to share. Oh, yeah. I forgot to share. So, yeah, okay. I mean, it, honestly, it's different for everybody. The, the The goal is to get the nervous system to feel safe. Obviously, a great way to do this is meditation, but already I can imagine people hanging up from the podcast. <laughs> yeah. But, for example, when I was a, uh, had really bad back pain, I would sit uh, and I would try to sit still for three minutes. My goal was three minutes. And I kid you not, I couldn't do it. Mm. I could not close my eyes for three minutes and just wait for the timer to go off. It felt like an eternity, but I've stuck with it and stuck with it. And now I use Insight Timer. That would be one of my biggest tips. Insight Timer is a free app. It's got a little meditation timer on and it's got all these pre-recorded meditations that you can do. On that note, I really feel like... Since you've mentioned yeah. the Insight Timer, they've got really good workplace package on there. That it, And for anyone listening, it's not that expensive to even perhaps give your employees access to. But they are there are workplace specific activities and exercises on there that are well worth exploring. Ooh, that's good to know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I would say meditation I honestly I would I would have um, not listened at the time when I needed to listen for this but later obviously I've realized how great it is um getting your sleep right is the number one yes. thing out of every single possible tip that I could give on chronic pain there are people doing my job the same work that I do and they will not work with clients until their sleep is at a point where it's relatively okay yeah I do work with people with bad sleep um because I also can help with that but the sleep is crucial and falling asleep looking at a device is the worst thing you can do because your brain is seeing a threat the last thing you see at night is is probably um you're comparing yourself on Instagram or whatever whatever And the second worst thing you can do is wake up to your phone. So like get your phone out of your bedroom, because if the first thing you look at is a WhatsApp from somebody, do you know what? It can can go both ways. You can look at um, an email, a work email or a WhatsApp and get bad news or a deadline that needs doing or whatever. But you also could look at your phone and have absolutely nothing and be like, why hasn't anyone emailed me? So <laughs> on that that's a huge one that really is and also regardless of what's even being looked at the blue light on its own for that first hour first two hours really before going to bed and the first hour when you wake up 
it that energy that energy and the electric magnetic frequencies that are coming off of that device as well as the light are messing with hormones um so yes. even take out the narrative that we have going on that then coupled with the actual um like physiological issues that are presenting as well like it's an absolute must it, and it's a, such a game changer the sleep so i'm so happy that you yeah. mentioned that. <laughs> i mean honestly if i was a surgeon hypothetically I would ethically, I wouldn't be able to operate on somebody for any physical bodily thing until I knew they were not sleeping with their phone in the bedroom. If you haven't even, yeah, not if you know what I mean, like that is so basic. It's yes. so basic. And it's, so, an, it's an easy win as well. I mean, you know, people can argue that for sure. But if you start with improving your sleep quality, it doesn't take anything away from you. And I think sometimes people think, well, I can't sleep more hours because I've got this to do or that to do. or This kid wakes me up or whatever. Right. All these responsibilities. But I think realistically, there's things you can do, like making your bedroom cooler, not having devices before bed, um, having um, like chamomile tea and things like that that help to bring you down will all just enhance the sleep you're yes. already having so there's no there's no loss here <laughs> there's nothing to lose. Oh, only gain yeah it's amazing the second thing i would say i don't know what number we're on no, but the, the, the next thing meditation. i would say yeah the, but the next thing i would say is you want to fall to sleep in a really happy positive and most importantly safe space inside your brain so have a gratitude practice. Again, it sounds very wishy-washy, but this has been used um, in the military to help soldiers be more resilient, more positive, and so on and so on. So all you need to do is literally have a little book next to your bed, a notebook, write five things down that you're grateful for that have happened during this day. And what it does, it forces your, your brain naturally defaults to negative, yeah. especially people with chronic pain. They're constantly thinking, what if this happens? What if I die and there's not enough money for my family? You know, what if I lose my job? And, and, and. So you do this gratitude practice. You think of things you're grateful for. It forces your brain to go back through the day, yep. drawing out all those positive things, yep. literally rewiring your brain on the spot. Yep. Then you go to sleep. And the last thing you're thinking about these positive things. Nice. And then you wake up in the morning and because your phone is not next to your bed, yep. you can get that out again and start the day off by looking at what you're grateful for the day before that's, that's super powerful exercise uh, and there's so much data and research studies that have been done to back that up so if you're still on the fence go go research that one for yourselves but there's something interesting that um i've seen and, and some of our uh, corporate clients do and that is within their teams they will have a gratitude whatsapp that is dedicated only for gratitude and they at the they encourage each other at, like towards the end of the day or even at the start of the day to um you know, to share, but it's not forced. So if somebody doesn't do it, that's okay too. And also it's not limited to those times of day. So if somebody's like, oh, I'm really grateful because Gemma come on and we had a really good conversation today, you know, you can share that at any time. It's just training that the, it's okay to be able to share this, but also to take moments to feel it. And that's then valued. And the reason for doing it at the start of the day and the end of the day is because they want to almost like leave a positive taste in their employees' mouths when they leave to go home right because too often and more often than not and as i'm sure you know you know people will leave busy work day and take that energy into their home life right which isn't appropriate sometimes for the families and it's it's this like slippery slope so what they wanted to do is create these blocks of transitional time so that was one of the practices that we put into there and it's really helped them like they've all said that they feel more connected to each other as a team they are actually noticing things before that are now that they weren't before so for example before it'd be like more negative bias stuff which we're all trained to, to do right but same but that's because we're feeling unsafe right why would see that negative thing like you mentioned in but that flipping it and actually seeing the good creates a sense of safety within so it really aligns with what it is you're saying i think yeah oh my goodness i could i love positive psychology it's like if everything was re rooted in positive psychology the world would be a happy place but it's it's proven it's tested it's it's science you know it's it's amazing and just on that last point you mentioned about um transitioning from work to home mm. um oftentimes i find that clients have got high stressful uh jobs high, high stressful is that the right word high you know what i mean high level of stress a yeah. lot of responsibility blah 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 they get home and they're still in this like 
um, their brain is still at work, you know. So what I uh, have suggested recently, which a client kind of came back and said how good it was for him, he drives home, but he stops in a lay-by before he gets to his house and he puts insight timer on. He does two minutes of breathing and yep. just sitting. Yep. And he says it's like he's doing a switch in his head that's going work, off, yep. home, on. And he said when he walks through the door, the demon off his body is so different and his kids are with him and you know everyone is happy and then the evening works out really really well you I know love that. So. I love that so much and I think if anybody's listening and they even think like just taking two minutes and, and like breathing because breathing still can be a bit weary for some people just put a song that you know uplifts you on and it can be any song that works for you uh, because like that can also be really really powerful and and when we have rhythm right and we're exposed to rhythm that helps to soothe our nervous system and it creates a sense of auto-regulation so that in itself is also another powerful alternative but i love the the transitional time and paying attention to that these pockets we've all got these little pockets of time that you know we're driving anyway (laughs) so how about we just like stay there for an extra minute it's possible it's easy to do it's not like you've got to sit down and do an hour meditation or like deep dive into past trauma like sometimes these small things can really really help right yeah 100% yeah oh I love this subject so, so Gemma in a work context what haven't we covered that we should have or that you would like to shine a light on um when it comes to chronic pain from a work point of view, um, work point of view, I would say anybody listening to this that's lucky enough to have executive coaching as part of their uh, development plan, this is, I am an executive coach and I specialize in stress and chronic pain. That, it, obviously, I am biased because this is what I do. But in my mind, there is no point having an executive coach that's going to help you be a better leader until you've got your health in the right place. Yeah. And it doesn't take many sessions. Most of the clients I work with, it's like six sessions, eight sessions. Yeah. And that's it. And then go off and, you know, and do all your leadership stuff. But I feel like the lessons that you learn in the process of fixing fixing the wrong word the recovering from chronic pain the lessons you learn in that are the best leadership lessons you will ever have yeah like I am not the same person now as I was before I had the back pain I've I've changed significantly as a person just unpacking who I am why I do what I do why does my brain always do this you know what, what's changed so. for you so you 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 described earlier like what you was experiencing what what shifted um so I, that's a really good question. I think back to when I was managing people, I was a new leader myself. I thought that everybody should be just like me. Uh, I, I've even been working with much, much, much older people um, who they are the way they are, and I will always be this way, and therefore I never everyone else to be the same. I judged people quite heavily for not being like me, and I'll give you a, a practical example. I am a task orientated tick list kind of person. I like structure. I never ever miss a deadline. Um, you know, when I work really hard, I've got really hard, high work ethic. But I had a team and half of my direct reports were just like me. And we do weekly check ins. They'd come to me with my list, they'd sit in front of me, and they'd be like, okay, I've done this, 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 and I've done this, and I haven't done that, but I'm going to do it next week and blah, blah. And I would be like, great. And I felt safe because they were just like me. Mm-hmm. And then the other half of my direct reports, they would come in and sit there and I would expect them to go through their list. But they were expecting me to ask about their family and ask how they are as a person and, and show a bit more empathy and be a bit more like um, less task driven, you know? But it wasn't natural for me to be like that. Whereas now I can see why it's not natural for me to be like that based on my Clifton strengths. Interesting. And so I can now use my strengths that I have got to give that kind of leadership that those people need. Yeah. So I can be there for both types of people now. But And all the judging is gone. Now I hire people that are different to me because they compliment me rather than getting frustrated with the 
things. But that's just one of many, many examples of how I've changed. That must have such a good effect on you, just from a, a confidence standpoint as well, that you are leading from a healthy place and you're leading from a safe space, right? And a place that then you have the ability to create that for the people around you as well, right? Yeah. And actually, you know, I, I was listening to something not too long ago about the leader's nervous system. So if the leader's nervous system is really um, on high alert, whether it's because they outwardly showingly have anxiety or stress or whatever, maybe you can tell because they're shouting a lot or they're getting angry, or even if their nervous system is on high alert because they've got chronic pain, everybody else in the team, their nervous system rises up to the person yes so by having quite literally by having back pain the rest of your staff their nervous system will match yours and and they may end up being physical symptoms as well if not just a bit more stress so rule of thumb so there, that, if you've got <laughs> pain you're not gonna do it for you do it for everybody around you <laughs> Seriously, because people with chronic pain tend to, and I say people, like it's literally me as well. Like we tend to be such people pleasers that we will put everybody else before us. But honestly, if you're not going to do it for yourself, if you're fine, oh, I live with pain, it's just because I'm old, fine. But do it for the people you live with. Do it for the people that care about you because it's very difficult to live or work for somebody with with them um, that's suffering. It's really hard. It's draining. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it will also be uh, a good mirror for other people to recognize perhaps some things within themselves as well that might need to shift uh, because we we only recognize those things when we usually are in a state of resource, right? We can be open to learning. We can be open to listening to the boss's way of doing something if we're in a good state. If we're not, yes. you're always going to butt heads and there's always going to be some resistance or friction there. And we want to really start to create teams that have less unhealthy friction friction's okay but it needs to be healthy friction and i think the way you link as well what you do the chronic pain with strengths i think is really interesting and i know a lot of people particularly in this region do a lot of strength training um i don't know how many of them look at it through the lens of health and looking at it through the lens of pain and how that interlinks with somebody being authentic and then having the confidence to show up as a leader as well. Have you got any kind of like cliff notes on that before we wrap up? I know that's a whole kind of conversation, I think, for another day, but I'm sure our listeners can find it. No, it's a great, great question. So Gallup, the company that created um, Strengths, over COVID time, they started to look at how strengths can help you from a wellness point of view. So there is a lot of material on it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know in the region who's focusing on it from a, from a let's say, a psychological safety point of view at work. Um, but these benefits naturally come. Anybody that's been through um, team building with, with StrengthsFinder will know that you go into the session yep. with maybe enemies at work. And then as you start unpacking each other's strengths, you look at each other and you're like, oh, that's why you're like that. I just thought you were difficult on purpose. Like, but you're not. You're, you're actually just different to me. And now I get you. Yep. And then you can change the way you approach them. You approach them in their strengths language. And you approach them giving them what they need rather than um, with from your angle, which is what obviously I always used to do, which is why I came up against a lot of resistance at work. So, yeah. And I know we're going to wrap up in, 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 just, in just a minute, but if anyone is listening to this and needs a bit more let's say proof of what I'm talking about is is real um there is a lot of research that's been done it's all evidence-based but one of the more recent ones is um the boulder study um and basically um 151 people who had been experiencing back pain for six months or more through a four-week program exactly like I do with clients four weeks, no physical, nobody touched these people, nobody manipulated their spine or anything. And after four weeks only, two thirds of them had got rid of their back pain and the, and it stayed off for more than a year. So if that's not evidence, you know, so Google the Boulder study and you'll see that pop, it's, it's, it's super famous and it just really drives home what we've been talking about. You mentioned earlier as well that you send out on your email list as well, lots of like different tips and research and things like this as well where can somebody get on that mailing list 
Yeah, so it's just my uh, website, gemmamcfall.com. And actually, uh, I've got all technology savvy now. So I've got a quiz called, Is Your Pain Curable? And you'll see it like as soon as you get to the website. And basically, it's a video of me talking through the basics of what we've done today. And then there's a series of questions. Do you have these personality types? Did any of this happen to you when you were younger? Does this happen with your pain, yes or no? And the more you answer yes, the more likely you have neuroplastic pain. So if you've been listening to this and you're thinking, oh yeah, mine's physical because my doctor says blah, blah, blah. Maybe you should take a quiz and it will just give you some food for thought, you know. And, and then from that point on, you're on my mailing list and then you're lucky enough to get my cheesy emails every week <laughs> with some tips. I love that. And and I think it's also important for, yes, listeners to go and do that. But also we've got obviously a lot of leaders that listen to this and a lot of managers that might be able to spot and catch some people, like we said earlier, uh, with some of the behaviors, with some of the conversations they're having, perhaps with the amount of times they're dipping out to go to the doctor and things like that, that might also benefit. For, so please, when you're thinking about this quiz, think about who else do you know that might benefit from it? And it might be somebody at work. It might be a family, a friend, whoever send it their way even if it's not for you send it their way because the more people we can move out of pain like the the more effective every everything else becomes and ultimately we become healthier happier and more high performing right so Gemma, Mm. my last question um is the same question i ask everybody which is which global goal you're supporting with your attendance on this podcast today so we obviously are making a donation to projects within your your choice on your behalf, which is global goal number three, help, good health and well-being. So tell us why is that so important for you? Oh, well, do you know, it's, that's a really great question and I wish I'd prepared. Health was not one of my values before. It never was a value. It's not something that even, you know, like if somebody handed me values, which are your values, I would never ever have chosen it. But not, having not had health for 10 years, Uh, with the back pain it is now my number one value and that is why I will do anything to support anything to do with health well-being it makes me so incredibly sad to think there's people suffering unnecessarily unnecessarily you know and so yeah like this is why it's important because it's literally it's it's my everything now yeah I love that. I love that so, so much. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Obviously, all of the links to where people can find you will be in the show notes. Um, I know you hang out on LinkedIn, Instagram, and obviously your website that you've already mentioned as well. So all of those links will be in there. Is there anything else that you want to say to our audience? Any final thoughts? Just thank you for listening. And you do not need to live in pain. You do not need to. Let's talk. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode and you haven't done so already, hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Then share it with a friend who you think might benefit. Spread the word. That's how we're going to impact the world by helping each other. We appreciate you so much and as always, unconditional love and wellness to you.